our good. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Uh, <laughs> Hosea 4. Man, all right. We've been in the courtroom, right, from chapter 4 on, where God does have a case against Israel. And his case is Israel's being charged where there is no faithfulness in the land. There is no loyal love for God. And there is no knowledge of God in the land. So in chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, God delivers his verdict. And God's verdict is that he's going to remove his presence. He's going to remove his protection. He's going to remove his provision for his people. And then in chapter 5, verses 8 through 15, we saw what that looks like. And it was horrifying, wasn't it? God is not just going to passively withdraw his presence. He is going to actively come in judgment where he's going to pour out his wrath like a flood, where he's going to be like a maggot in an open wound to make Israel's injuries worse. And then he's going to be like a ferocious lion that will tear them to pieces. And this is horrifying because what is it showing us? It shows us what all sin deserves. All sin deserves death, destruction, desolation. But there is hope. Because Hosea in chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, he calls upon Israel to repent. To repent of their spiritual adultery and return to God. Because the one who tore to pieces is the one who will heal. The one who tore down is the one who will bind and raise up. God will restore and resurrect the ruins. He will give new life. He will revive his people if they repent and return to him. If they come earnestly, honestly, sincerely seeking his face. Well, <laughs> this week we're going to see how Israel responds to Hosea's call. And the imagery of this poetic prophecy does not describe Israel in a very favorable way. So <laughs> get ready to hear more bad news. <laughs> and I'm going to have you stay seated. We're going to read Hosea chapter 6, beginning in verse 4, all the way through chapter 7, verse 16. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning mist, like the dew that goes early away. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love, this is that Hebrew word, chesed, loyal love, mercy, loving kindness, Love that is faithful. This is what I desire. Not sacrifice. I desire the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But like Adam, they, Israel, transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly with me. Gilead is the city of evildoers, tracked with blood. As robbers lie wait for a man, so the priests band together. They murder on the way to Shechem. They commit villainry. In the house of Israel, I have seen a horrible thing. Ephraim's whoredom is there. Israel is defiled. For you also, Ju O Judah, a harvest is appointed when I restore the fortunes of my people. When I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is revealed and the evil deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely. The thief breaks in, and the bandits raid outside, but they do not consider that I remember all their evil. Now their deeds surround them. They are before my face. By their evil they make their king glad, and their princes by their treachery. They are adulterers. They are like a heated oven whose baker ceases to stir the fire from the kneading of the dough until it is leavened. On the day of our king, the princes became sick with the heat of wine. He stretched out his hand with mockers, for with hearts like an oven they approached their intrigue. 
All night their anger smolders. In the morning it blazes like a flaming fire. All of them are hot as an oven and they devour their rulers. All their kings have fallen and none of them, none of them calls upon me. Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Strangers devour his strength and he knows it not. Gray hairs are sprinkled upon him, and he knows it not. The pride of Israel testifies to his face, yet they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all of this. Ephraim is like a dove, silly and without sense, calling to Egypt, going to Assyria. As they go, I will spread over them my net. I will bring them down like birds of the heavens. I will discipline them according to the report made to their congregation. Woe to them, for they have strayed so far from me. Destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. They do not cry to me from the heart, but they wail upon their beds for grain and wine. They gash themselves. They rebel against me. Although I trained and strengthened their arms, yet they now devise evil against me. They return, but not upward. They're like a treacherous or faulty bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, again, another word that's kind of hard to be thankful for. But there are seven, seven descriptive metaphors and similes in this passage that describe what Israel is like. Israel is like a morning mist. They're like an overheated oven. They're like a unbaked, half-baked cake. They're like a deluded old man. They're like a senseless bird. They're like a preoccupied prayer with self. And they're like a faulty bow. (laughs) All of these descriptions are exposing the fact that Israel may go through the motions of repenting, but there's no heart affection for God. There is no chesed for God. And because of this, notice the struggle that God goes through. His bride has left him. He's watching her chase after other lovers. He's watching her destroy herself and those around her. He sees everything she's doing. He calls for her to return. He wants her to come back home. But she refuses. And verse 4 is heartfelt. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What should I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning mist that leaves early. I mean, these questions, they capture God's pain, don't they? God longs to embrace them, but they refuse to return with sincerity. Their love, their chesed, it's like a morning mist that disappears so quickly, right? It shows up, but it doesn't last. It's fleeting, it's fading. And therefore, because Israel's love for God is so fleeting and fading, God sends warnings. He sends the prophets. He employs them to be his mouthpiece to proclaim his word and his law. Look at verse 5, therefore I have hewn them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. See, Hosea is not the only prophet ministering in Israel. Amos is as well. And Isaiah also ministers a little bit in the north, but he primarily ministers to Judah. So all three are communicating God's word to Israel and Judah. All three are declaring God's judgment upon them. All three are calling for them to repent and return to God. The writer of Hebrews says this, For the word of God, it's living and active. 
It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerns the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. The sword of God's word cuts deep into our hearts. (laughs) And it exposes the hidden motivations there. The light of God's word exposes the darkness within and it shines forth the reasons why God's judgment is coming. And this hit me. (laughs) Um, Why is the function of the prophets and the law not enough to cause Israel to repent and to return to God? And this sounds awkward, I know, but think about it for a moment, right? Who here likes to be exposed? Who here likes to be told that what you're doing is wrong? And because of what you're doing is wrong, who here likes to be told you're under God's judgment? And then think about this. (laughs) How many of the prophets were actually successful in their calling? (laughs) How many of the prophets were liked? I mean, the majority of them were killed by God's people. Right? That was our scripture reading. (laughs) So what's my point? All right. My point is this. How people respond to God's word exposing them, how they respond to being exposed is exposing in and of itself, isn't it? How we respond to being exposed exposes something else. So let's see if we can see what that is. See, people can either continue to run away from God when they're exposed because they want to keep doing what they want to do even if they know in God's eyes it's wrong. Or they can humble themselves and step into the light where they admit their sin, they repent of their sin, and they return to God. But there's a third option. (laughs) And this third option is hard to detect because this third option is not as easy to visibly see. You see, people can return to God, but not out of love for God. They return for some other motivation. Look at verse 6, because verse 6 is a double-edged sword that exposes the hidden motives of the heart. For I desire steadfast, loyal love, not sacrifice. For I desire the knowledge of me rather than burnt offerings. So apparently some in Israel did heed Hosea's call in chapter 6. Verses 1 through 3, they renewed their religious duties, but not out of loyal love for God. Their repentance was more out of duty, not out of love. So they sacrifice, they offer burnt offerings because they're supposed to, but they have no love and no knowledge of God while they're doing it. So what's being exposed? They're performing their religious duties from a motivation driven by fear of punishment and hope of reward. And these are selfish motives, are they not? If I do something to avoid getting punishment, or if I do something so that I get blessing, Where's the focus and who are you doing it for? Yourself. Not for God. God wants our love, not our sacrifice. God wants our hearts, not our rituals. Isaiah says this about these people. In Isaiah 29, verse 13, these people draw near with their mouths. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. David, after he sinned with Bathsheba, 
confesses in Psalm 51, for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering after the sin that I committed, in other words. Instead, what is it? The sacrifices of God are this, a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Man, we see this today, don't we? I mean, seriously. People may be faithful to come to church, and they may faithfully be involved in the church. But are they coming out of fear of God's punishment? Are they coming to try to leverage some blessing from God? You see, our churches can be filled with thousands of people who profess Christ but have no love for Christ. And it's not my place to judge them. God's word will judge them. But there are some telltale signs, okay? When Jesus says you will know them by their fruit, here's one of the things. You will know them by how they react to being exposed. When God's word like a sword penetrates and the light shines and exposes the darkness within, how do people respond? Do they cling to Jesus and his bride, the church? Or do they turn away from God and leave the church? Or here's another way you will know them. You will know them by... <laughs> how they respond when things don't go their way. When they suffer, will they cling to God and his bride, the church, or will they turn away from God and leave the church? And here's one other way, and I've given this way because Jesus is going to actually quote Hosea 6 in a specific context. You will know them by how they deal with real sinners. Do they judge them? Do they look down upon them? Do they refuse to associate with them? You see, in Matthew 9, Jesus quotes Hosea 6.6, 6, <laughs> and he's quoting it to the religious leaders. See, here's the context. Matthew, who's a tax collector, Levi, he just became a follower of Jesus. And so what does he do? He invites all the other tax collectors and sinners that he knows to come to his house to celebrate and have a meal with Jesus. So here is Jesus reclining at the table in the house, and behold, we're told, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. For I desire mercy, chesed, loyal love, and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but to call sinners. So I have to ask, are you going through the motions? Are you doing your Christian duty? You show up, you're involved, but are you here because you truly love God? Or are you here for another reason? Are you here to try to bribe God to avoid his punishment? Are you here to try to leverage and get some blessing from God? God doesn't want your sacrifice. He wants your love. He wants your heart. And I may need to pick up the pace here because <laughs> we got a long way to go. Um, chapter 6, verse 7 through chapter 7, verse 7, it's one unit where God is exposing the different forms of leadership in Israel and the corruption that's going on there with the priests, with the rulers, with the kings, and with their courts. 
So you remember, Hosea began his ministry during the time of Jeroboam II, right? And this, you're not going to remember this, but I will remind you of it. This was the second golden age in Israel's history. It was a time of peace and prosperity for them, okay? But after Jeroboam II dies, it quickly regresses bad. Because six kings ruled over the next 30 years. <laughs> Three of them ruled for less than two years. One ruled only a month, and four of them were assassinated. So look at verses 9 and 10. As robbers lie in wait for a man, so the priests band together. They murder on the way to Shechem. They commit villainy. In the house of Israel, I've seen a horrible thing. Look at verse 1 through 3 of chapter 7. The iniquity of Ephraim is revealed, the evil deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely. The thief breaks in, the bandits raid outside, but they do not consider that I remember all their evil. Now their deeds surround them. They are before my face. By their evil, they make their king glad and the princes glad by their treachery. So, summarize. What are we seeing? When people are not faithful to God, they're not going to be faithful to one another. When we turn away from God, it's going to affect our relationships and to the scale that all of society is affected. There will be a breakdown of social relationships which will lead to the breakdown of society. So what rules today in Israel? Violence, chaos. And God sees it all. And he says it's a horrible thing. Instead of condemning the evil, the priests, the kings, and the rulers, they actually delight in their evil. They participate in it. Now look at verse 4 to see how Hosea describes it. They're all adulterers, they are like a heated oven whose baker ceases to stir the fire, which means even though the baker turns the fire down, the fire in them rages. So, this description, Israel is like an overheated oven. Their passions, in other words, are out of control and intensifying. They were, we could say this, on fire for sin. <laughs> because they are consumed by their sinful desires, what do they do? They devour and consume others. And isn't this what sin does? Sin feeds sin. When we turn away from God to chase after other lovers that can't satisfy us, what happens? We remain empty. And in our emptiness, our longing to be filled gets greater and greater and greater. And our desires get hotter and hotter and hotter. Where it gets out of control. Where we must have it. We have to have it. <laughs> and we'll do anything to get it. And what does that usually mean? Somebody else is going to pay the price. And look at verse 7. None of them, while this is going on, calls upon me. So the focus of chapter 6, verse 6, through chapter 7, verse 7, it's on Israel's internal politics and their plotting. It's exposing what's going on in them. The focus of chapter 7, verses 8 through 16, it's on their idolatrous foreign policy. And <laughs> the um, descriptions come fast and furious here, okay? So I'm going to come fast and furious with them. Look at verse 8. Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. Ephraim is a cake not turned. <laughs> a cake not turned over is going to be burnt on one side and uncooked on the other. <laughs> so what's he saying? Uh, Israel is neither one thing nor the other. Israel is neither a pagan nation, nor is it a holy nation. Remember, God set Israel apart, right? To be what? A holy nation. A nation that would be distinct from all other nations. 
a nation that would live out and demonstrate the character of who God is and what God does to the nations. But now, they've mixed. (laughs) And now that they're mixed, they no longer perform their function. And the more Israel mixes and becomes like the nations, the less Israel has to offer. You see, the more they act like the pagans around them, then the less attractive God becomes to the nations around them. Why? Because (laughs) I don't see the difference it makes in your life, so why would I believe your God when my God's the same? So isn't this a warning to the church? The more we mix with the world, the more we become like the world, then the less we have to offer. You see, if the church loses its distinctiveness, it loses its attractiveness. When who God is and what God does to save us, when that no longer impacts and affects our lives, then how in the world can it affect and impact the lives of others? If people don't see God making a difference in our marriages, if people don't see God making a difference in the way we raise our children, if people don't see the difference that God makes in the way we love our neighbor, in the way we work, man, then why would they want anything to do with God and with Christianity? If we're just like them, we have nothing to offer them. Which leads to the next description in verses 9 and 10. Israel is like a deluded old man. Oh, baby, here we go. Strangers devour his strength and he knows it not. Gray hairs are sprinkled upon him, and he knows it not. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. In other words, Israel is like an aging man who still acts like a teenager. Israel is like an aging man who does not grow old gracefully. Israel's days of prosperity are over, but they still think they can get it back. They can recapture the glory days. They think they're strong enough. And in their pride, they don't see how weak they really are. They don't see how their glory is really fading. They're deluded in other words. And we'll see that more next week, okay? Uh, Which leads then to the next description in verses 11 through 13. Israel is like a silly, senseless dove. A dove which flutters around but never settles. A dove which flutters around from place to place and then forgets how to get back home. Sometimes Israel looks to Assyria to be their savior and other times they look to Egypt to help them. All the while they did not look for God and his help. So God says, I'm going to catch them in the net of my judgment. And isn't this what we do after we turn away from God, right? (laughs) See, it's not just one lover that we go to, right? We flutter around from one lover to the next lover to the next lover and to the next. You see, when we don't find satisfaction here, what do we do? We fly over here. And if we can't find it over here, we're going to go over there. And if we can't get it over there, we're going to go over there. And on and on it goes. And then we stray so far from God that we don't know how to get back home. Maybe, maybe, when we are like a silly, senseless dove, maybe when we realize how lost we really are, it will cause us to cry out to God. And this is what Israel finally does. Uh, But look at the description in verse 14. They cry out to me from, they do not cry out to me from the heart. 
They wail upon their beds for grain and wine. They gash themselves. They rebel against me. So wailing upon their beds is just simply saying they're crying out frequently. Okay? They're frequently crying out, but notice what they're praying for and notice what they do to get it. <laughs> they want the grain and the wine. They want their needs met. And then how do they try to get it? They gash themselves. This is what pagans do. They gash themselves in an attempt to appease their God to give them what they want. So what's the next description? Because this is what it leads to. Israel's like a faulty bow. God has always protected his people when they cried out to him for help. God had always equipped and trained them. God has always strengthened them to defeat their enemies. Israel has been trained by God, and now God says, they're using what I taught them against me. Huh, what does that mean? They return, but not in an upward direction. They're like a faulty bow. What's a faulty bow? A faulty bow is aimed at its target, but once it's let go, whew, because the bow is faulty, the arrow veers off course. So Israel's are showing repentance, but their lives aren't directed towards God. They veer off course and they go to something else. So I got to ask you, <laughs> which of these descriptions describes you? How many of these descriptions describe you? Or I could ask it this way, where are you on this flow of descriptions? Because they do flow. You see, if last week we saw what our sins deserve, what are we seeing this week? We're seeing the path of sin. We're seeing the course of sin. See, when our love for God is like a fleeting, fading mist, what happens? We chase after other lovers. And because these lovers can't satisfy us, our passions get so worked up and heated that we become like an overheated oven. When we turn to the things of this world to try to satisfy us, <laughs> we become like a half-baked cake. Burn on one side and uncooked on the other. In other words, nobody can tell if you're a Christian or not. We become useless in our service to God because we're consumed with self. And the longer we become consumed with self, we become like a deluded old man. In our pride, we still think we can capture the glory days. We think we're strong enough. We think we're wise enough to get what we want, thinking we can do it on our own. And because we think we can do it on our own, what are we like? A silly, senseless dove fluttering around from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. And then we've strayed so far from God that we don't know how to find our way home. So what do we do? We pray fervently to God. But maybe it's a prayer that is so preoccupied and focused on self. We pray not because we're interested in God. We pray because we want God's blessing. So we jump through our religious hoops to try to leverage blessing from God. Which leads to us being the last description, like a faulty bow. We're aiming at God, but we're veering off course. We're still chasing after other things. Not God. So now I want to go back to my original question. Okay, and I know I'm going a little bit long. Okay, so bear with me. Could the function of the prophets and the law be a major reason why Israel refuses to repent and return to God? I mean, what do the law and the prophets do? They expose Israel's sin. <laughs> they expose Israel's need to repent and return to God. <laughs> but doesn't Israel's response to this expose something as well? It exposes they don't want to return to God. 
Maybe I could ask it this way. Why did all of Hosea's pleading for his wife to return not work? Answer, because she still thinks other lovers will satisfy her more than her husband. So what's the only thing that will work? <laughs> what is the only thing that will cause an unfaithful, wayward wife to return? Is it not for her to see a greater, more faithful love? A greater, more faithful love that is not like other lovers. A greater love that can actually fill us and give us what other lovers can't. A love so great that it forgives our unfaithfulness and covers our sin. Now, we've already saw Hosea's greater love by going in the slave market to buy his wife back, right? We already looked at that. But here's what's interesting. Look at chapter 6, verse 7. They, like Adam, have transgressed my covenant. That's interesting. What's the connection with that? Because in the garden was the very first picture of salvation. You see, it's the very first picture of God's greater love after Adam and Eve sinned. You see... After they sinned, God's coming to them in judgment, right? And he's condemning the, peop the parties that were involved. And while he's condemning the serpent, in verse 15 of Genesis 3, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He, somebody, singular, from the line of the woman, is going to crush the head of the serpent while the serpent strikes his head. This is the first announcement of the gospel, okay? The first announcement of the gospel where God is promising someone from the line of the woman is going to come and crush and destroy everything that happened in the garden. A singular son from the line of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. He's going to reverse the consequences of the fall, and he's going to restore God's relationship with his people. And there's a picture given in chapter 3 that is so easy to miss. See, what was God's command to Adam and Eve that they disobeyed and brought the destruction of everything? In Genesis 2, it says, You shall eat from any tree in the garden, but not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day you eat of it, what will happen? You will surely die. It's that day, and they did not die. But something else did. You see, immediately after they sinned, what did they do? Well, their eyes were opened, right? And they saw their nakedness. And so they hid from God, and then they covered their nakedness with fig leaves. When they were exposed, they tried to do something to cover their guilt and shame. But it was an insufficient covering. And don't miss this. Verse 21, we can easily pass over this in Genesis 3. We are told that the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Where did God get the garments of skin? From an animal. What had to happen to that animal? It had to die. And then God takes the skin of that animal and covers Adam and Eve with it. So do you see the picture? Adam and Eve lived because that animal took their place and died. Adam and Eve lived because that animal paid the price for their sin. Adam and Eve lived because God took the skin of that animal and covered them with it so that they could stay in his presence. And only the skin is sufficient to cover their guilt and shame. You see the picture of God's greater love here. 
a love so faithful and so great that it was willing to sacrifice his own son to get you back. A love so faithful and great that the son was willing to be that sacrifice, was willing to take your place to pay for what your sin deserves. And when you trust in him, God takes his righteousness and he covers you with it. So now you stand before God perfect. You stand before God holy and blameless. This greater love is the reason why you live. This greater love, in other words, to apply it now to our text, is the reason why you can repent. This greater love is the reason why you can return to God when you wander away from Him. Because did you notice from our text? At every stage, God is still calling them to return. (laughs) Which means, at every stage, you still can return. So what's the exhortation? No matter where you are on the path of sin, look at the greater and more faithful love of God who sent his son to be your sacrifice. Because of his sacrifice, because his righteousness covers all of your unrighteousness, repent and return to God. Why? So you can experience his pardon. So you can experience his forgiveness. So that you would know when you're exposed, He covers your guilt and shame. Amen.